these people, apart from being overpaid, they end up in, um, you know, positions where they're, you know, adored, they've got a lot of time on their hands, um, and then they think that they can behave in whatever way that they want. And um, whether it's substance abuse in the end that must make somebody behave like that, but uh, it's just um, the, it, it is the fact that Australian Australia has always been obsessed by sport, and they've always held that sports people up to be heroes as opposed to anybody or the biggest heroes as opposed to anybody else. And I think this is a byproduct of that. Can I just say, if we did a poll of this room, how many of you would have had that guy in your team? Yes? Who would have had you? How many? Paul? How many would not have had him in? How many would not have had him in the team? Well, and, uh, there's no way any woman would ever, if they were in charge of those teams, there's no way any of those blokes would be anywhere near it. Like the culture in which that bloke exists is very similar to the sort of like fanatic jock thing that goes on in high schools all across the country where that behaviour is normalised and the people next to him, whether they're like him or not, don't stand up and do something about it. I've same thing, grew up with a few people like that and you get this sense of um, they're treated like a prodigy from the age of sort of 15. They get a sense of entitlement, they get a sense of uh, that, you know, they get treated as if they're something special from that age and I've seen ones that have, that have dropped off and never quite made it, they still act like that and you see ones that do and they still act like that until something really bad happens, they get pulled in by the club and then they get told to pull their head in. But again, it comes down to sense of entitlement. Um, Completely taken for granted, no no sense of grounding, and especially in like rugby league, like yeah, it's shocking. That being said, union people are much better. Maybe cricket. Uh, I hate to say this, right, but he's probably the lucky one that was actually good at something. Like rugby league and the AFL have to do, you know, generally have the people that come through their systems often come from extremely dysfunctional backgrounds, right? And he's, he, because he's got to a point where he's become on notice, he's come out of a dysfunctional background. What you were saying is absolutely right. He's, there's stacks of people who aren't good at football or aren't good at cricket or anything like that that are coming out of these same backgrounds, right, that have the same problems and just go to jail, right? Like, he's lucky he's not in jail. But, and, and probably the thing that saved him in a way was not erotic. Wayne Bennett picked him up because he was cheap. Right? That's how cutthroat rugby league and AFL and the rest of these sports are. He got him because he got him cheap. He's paying about $80,000 a year to run into a brick wall every, every weekend, right? But, 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 it's, but it's a broader issue than that, right? It's just the fact is that there are lots of kids, I hate to say, that are coming through with the same sort of attitude, the same coming out of these horrible backgrounds, right, that we're not dealing with them. We talked about homelessness or mentioned it before. Right, but this is just as big an issue, is that how do we deal with kids who don't know their fathers or have never known who their fathers are? If you've never been in that circumstance, you probably would think they're the devil, but there's a lot of people like these kind of players that have done terrible things in their life, but society and, and these people in, in particular will never get better unless we allow them to redeem themselves and try and do something better. So, you know, it's definitely not simple, but and it feels counterintuitive to be able to give them the second chance but I think sometimes that can be the best solution. Actually on that though I don't think he has um, you know suffered the repercussions of his actions I think that's the problem with this particular case and I think generally that's a good comment but there should be that punishment element of their actions because you can't sort of just go and go oh actually yeah I did that four years ago I'm sorry now but I'm gonna go on and you know earn 80,000 or whatever it is now but he will earn more you know in another five years people are then gonna forget and only remember him playing sport and it'll move on he hasn't sort of given compensation to the family he hasn't um, you know he's done therapy I think he's done six weeks or whatever it is I don't think that's enough for what he did so I think the um, punishment for these actions should be more severe to deter people from you know doing those things and making it seem like oh it's okay people make mistakes I think the punishment and yes then we sort of look at how they um, are then brought into society again and I don't think it should be just forget and move on. Um, my area of expertise is not taxation however it is child protection and juvenile justice and this is not anecdotal evidence but 
children who come from disadvantaged backgrounds are no more likely to commit crimes than children that come from wealthy parents. Why? So, nor if they've got a single mother are they more likely to commit a crime. Now, why you often don't hear about that is because they um, have parents who are able to buy things off and that's true they don't end up because they get instead of legal aid they have a very good barrister representing them in the children's court sorry to burst your bubble I did a quick Google search Matthew Lodge's mother is a policewoman and his father is a command was a commander or detective in the state crime command so uh, not a disadvantaged background Maybe a, um, an overly, um, uh, you know, authoritarian background might be the problem that the boy has, or maybe he's just a dickhead. <laughs> but he ain't disadvantaged and he didn't come from a single family and I'm 100% with you. That's my field as well, criminology, and disadvantaged kids don't commit more crimes than other people. They just get policed harder and caught more often. That's all. I feel like circumstance for me, in my beliefs, has always played a big role in these things. So is it not, circumstance doesn't have to be that you're born to a wealthy family or whatever it is, but I feel like circumstance could be if you fall into the wrong crowd or the wrong situation presents itself or you're in the, you know, even alcohol or drugs or something else. Yeah, anything. But yeah, that's, that's, I, yeah, so that's my, because I've always, felt like circumstance is the biggest impactor on somebody's behaviour rather than their, that people are genu genuinely bad from the beginning. Like it's not that people are bad, it's just people get caught up in circumstances where they act a certain way. Nurture yeah, nurture versus nature is, is the argument. That's why I would, that's what I'd be interested in seeing what you guys think on that one. My response to that is that the circumstance you're talking about is not where they find themselves, but it's the over-policing and over-sentencing uh, of disadvantaged and marginalised youths and people. So if you're in Dubbo and you're Indigenous or whatever, you are going to be policed 24 hours a day. If you're wealthy, you can do exactly the same stuff in Vaucluse or wherever, ain't no cops around there to see you beat people up or buy your weekly round of coke or get pissed or rape your girlfriend or whatever so uh, yes circumstances but not the circumstances that you're talking about the circumstances of our society are the problem. The way we look at this is sometimes a little bit skewed so we get very focused on the individual and the redemption story and I think that's important but what we forget to do is think about the effects of the thousands of people potentially millions of people that witnessed that behavior on television and saw that it wasn't um, sort of rightfully shamed and was therefore made and normalised and made okay and what are the economic and like societal implications of that versus giving this person the ability to have the redemption piece and I think if you weighed up the economic implications and the societal implications it's much more rational for us to actually shame this individual and make it clear that this is wrong. I also think from a behavioural psychology perspective as a society shame is actually a very important construct and we should use it because it actually is a very powerful tool and if we actively shame these people yes okay there are elements of that we have to be very careful around you know their mental health and what have you there has to be constraints around that but the problem is we don't shame these people enough and it becomes even more normalised and accepted and I think it's you know gender is a, a difficult one to talk about but it's very difficult to watch that as a woman because as a woman you're like here we go again you know and it, you, you never feel that sense of that kind of the society coming to the table and going this isn't okay. From the scene of action cameramen televise events which you may see in your own home. You must in addition develop a high degree of coordination between hand and mind. 